Some people say I invented the mountain bike, and maybe I did. But even before that, I was a racer, a frame builder, an innovator, and still am today. I'm Tom Ritchie, and this is my story. I grew up in a in in the probably the perfect environment for doing what I'm doing right now. My dad had just taken us from uh, New Jersey uh, and moved us out as a family to take a job in the tech industry, so to speak. He he was a smoker and and uh, lived without a without all the uh, outlets of activity when when he moved us out and I was six years old to California. He joined the Sierra Club, started small boat racing, and became a, a cyclist. And I just found myself uh, kind of in his shadows quite a bit of the time, looking not just uh, uh, for projects that he was interested in the garage and the family garage, but also wanting to follow him around on my bike. And, uh, and then around seventh grade, I remember being out on a ride with my dad, and the first time I can recall, I'd, I actually dropped him. And I, and I didn't realize how powerful it was until it happened. Um, but it set up a, um, a, uh, a passion that started from that point forward that had some competitiveness in it, some, you know, design uh, part of it. And, uh, you know, that along with uh, plenty of great weather in California and a Bay Area lifestyle and engineers at every turn and, and, uh, uh, and, and a dad that, that wanted to do things with me and supported me was, was a very, um, very uh, good combination. When I found myself finally getting into the racing environment, uh, prompted by a friend and I that were kind of out riding and ran into some, um, some guys that were training, they invited us to become, um, become their teammates and to, went through a couple of, of bike choices. It led to me actually needing, needing to repair my Chinelli because I broke it. And so at 14, I repaired that Chinelli and I realized that what was inside wasn't all that impressive. And that led to building my own frame. And you, pretty much at any turn, I was just uh, surrounded by people that were confident and they were saying, you know, you can do that. I found myself training with these guys, training with Olympic team riders. The 72 Olympics had just happened. Um, I found myself beating them. It, it led me to, uh, to, to think to myself, well, if I'm out here on a training ride with them and I'm dropping them, why can't I go to a race and uh, do well against them? I had uh, 84.9 gear restrictions as a junior. They didn't have a restriction. My races were limited to 50 miles as a junior. Their races were 120 miles. I want to see what happens, you know, in the long distance. And the very first race I entered um, was Martinez Crockett Road Race as a senior. And by the end of the race, I had dropped everyone and, and uh, came in alone. And, and right at the end, I dropped the rider who had just uh, uh, raced the Olympics the previous year. And I ended up winning the race, and that was kind of the the beginning of that senior slayer moniker that that cursed me to race senior races more than junior races at that point in my um, in my life.
it definitely gave me some confidence and it gave me some ideas on what I could do, not just in terms of of, uh, of racing, but also um, as a builder. I remember, <laughs> I remember one sequence when I was probably 15 or 16, and I brought the bike that I had built into a bike shop, the leading bike shop in the in the Palo Alto area. The head mechanic there was a national team mechanic. He said, "Yeah, they can teach monkeys how to build bikes. They, you know, Richie can build a bike." And I, I, you know, a comment like that didn't didn't discourage me. It only encouraged me. Somebody that raced on his own product, proved his own product, won on his own product, brought a lot of attention, and it was you know over a period of years of not only just making uh, hundreds of bikes that people began to truly trust me as a, as as a builder. Graduating high school, I remember building about 150 frames that year and a majority of them were through Powell to Bike Shop and they were the first national mail order uh, catalog and they showcased my frames. So I got a lot of attention not just from my racing but from having a national catalog and stayed kind of in that in that limelight uh, up until mountain bikes. One of the th influences in my life that was probably as strong, if not stronger, than my father was a, uh, was a man named Yopes Brandt. His reputation was about as strong as it could get. And I remember when I first showed up on one of his rides with, with a bike that I made, he gave me heck and said, we are going on a serious ride. We don't wait for people. If you break your bike, Richie, you're on your own, you know. And it, it really put the fear of God in me. And and I remember going across a bridge, and he said, "See this way this bridge is designed? That's the way a bike needs to be designed." He he showed me the triangulation of all the trusses, and he said, "Don't ever take." tubes and connect them without them uh, having intersection points common to a triangle. He lived in these areas with fire roads and trails and, and, and he, was, he was riding them and uh, putting so many miles on my bike side by side with Yopes in the Santa Cruz Mountains and the Sierras instilled upon me a tremendous respect for design. So by the time I, I uh, met up with Joe Breeze um, in 78 when he came to order a 10 for him and Otis Guy, I'd probably built a thousand frames and uh, you know had, had ridden tens of thousands of miles and ridden thousands of them off-road with Yopes and others. And when Joe showed me his, his first ballooner, I, I thought, hey, that's pretty cool. And I think I told him that uh, I'd already been challenged to build something by another gentleman, uh, John Finley Scott, the late John Finley Scott. And he was enamored and a believer in an English bike called the Woodsy bike. Using 650 B wheels, they, they would you know go on farm roads and trails and stuff in England. And I'd already, I told, I think I showed Joe that bike and I told him that I was already building that. Uh, I thought the, the 26 inch version of it would be interesting too. So uh, when Joe got home that day, I think Gary heard that I had said to Joe that I was going to build one. And the next thing I know it, I've got a call from Gary Fisher saying, hey, if, hey, Richie, if you build one, man, build one for me. And so probably within a, a month or two, I think built not just myself, not just for Gary, but I built, not telling him, a third one and only when he came to pick up the bike and pay for it did he, uh, did I tell him, hey, I got a third one if you got anyone that wants one. And, uh, and of course he did. I think the next, uh, the next thing I, I found myself doing is just kind of building another 10 
and seeing what would happen with that. And the rest is kind of history in terms of the, um, the new business opportunities that resulted from those first bikes. Still, in 1978, there was, there was so little respect for uh, the American builder. The, the strength of, of uh, imported frames from Europe was, was very, very strong. The Giracchiotis, the Colnagos, and the other brands were in their heyday at that point in time. So I was uh, competing against frames that were coming from Europe with a very high reputation. My add-on, I mean, my value add was the fact that I would build a custom bike. And one of the tools that I began to employ was the ability to build without lugs. But what it gave me is it gave me a unique skill to go away from conventional diameters and geometry. For example, oversized tubes were a big deal back in the beginning of mountain bikes. Um, if you were to build a mountain bike with traditional sized tubes, a one inch top tube and an inch and eight down tube, it wasn't strong enough. And so as, as the challenges seemed to come more and more toward me because of the customization that I could do, um, I found that the other products that people were interested in, like, like making stems and fillet brazing them and making other, other uh, components and fillet brazing them, uh, made it a natural to transition to thinking about the component side of the business. I found myself having to solve problems with the mountain bike that had never been solved because the bike was such a new bike clearances and, and uh, handlebars and seat posts, there weren't any seat posts longer than a 200 millimeter seat post. So I had to, I built the first 350, 400 millimeter seat posts and of course the bull moose handlebar came as a result of bars and stems slipping as you're going downhill and, and hitting a bump. My door was being knocked on by uh, the, uh, the Japanese, the Suntours and the Shimanas of the world. Uh, asking me what I would do if I was to design a product. And I, I wanted to keep building bikes, but I needed to figure out ways of growing my company beyond my frame building. And so I took a trip to Japan and, and met with a, a tire maker, a handlebar maker, and, and uh, a tubing maker over there. And I started to develop components uh, that would go on my bikes and be offered to the growing mountain bike customers that were out there just about every turn. After I'd, I'd uh, made some mountain bikes, one of the things that, that became um, as much a part of me as it did with road bikes is racing. We all love to race the mountain bike and races became more and more popular. When Repack kind of shut down, other races filled, filled their place and, and uh, in the 83 national championships, the first national championships down in uh, in Santa Barbara, I remember going down there, Eric Hyden was on my team, um, Sterling Mc, McBride, uh, Gary was of course, uh, I raced, and uh, Team Ritchie became a powerhouse. And we were the first true powerhouse in the market. Toward the end of the 80s, there was um, this amazing environment which uh, started out with Don Myra, winning the 89 World Championships for Team Ritchie with a P23 and components that I had brought to the market at that point in time, cranks and handlebars and stems and tires and rims and wheels and all kinds of other things. And, and I found myself realizing that it was very, very important for every Ritchie product 
to be tough and durable. Uh, otherwise, the world stage and the, and the, and the cameras and the, and the press and all the things that were happening at that time focused on mountain bike racing could be uh, a double-edged sword for me. And that, that crucible of, of, uh, of pressure led to accelerated development and proving development and me proving it personally being the first kind of test guinea pig in product development and use uh, made the company and, and Rishi what it is. It was a very dynamic environment that I was in the middle of. I was racing, I was designing all the components, I was involved with the management of the team, and it led to a very strong relationship with me and key team riders, Thomas and Henrik and, and, and Ruthie and others, that they were relying upon me for delivering them the tool that they could win races with. And they did. In the 90s, they won everything every practically world championship and, uh, and world cup race and it was, a, it was a powerhouse team and there was a lot of responsibility to deliver not just a bike that was going to be the best for them but components that were going to be the best for them and I, I more and more focused on trying to build only components and it was, it was a lot of fun and, and an awful lot of work. Coming from racing, realizing how important it is to relate to the racer's mindset has been core to who I am as a company ever since the beginning. I was my own product designer. I related in a unique way to the racer. It continues through this day. It's the way that teams look at Richie, whether they be pro tour teams or continental teams or mountain bike racing teams like Swiss Power. They look at me as more than just a component supplier. They really look at me as a partner in giving them the best chances of winning. This is my big backyard. <laughs> Ah. <sighs>